Jazzcast Pros. Welcome to Grace and Grind, the podcast redefining what it means to act like a lady, but think like a boss. All while helping female professionals navigate the intricacies of the workplace with poise, confidence, and grace. Greetings, my graceful grinders. This is your host, Dr. Pamela Brown Grinion, with the Grace and Grind podcast. And today I have a special guest treat for you. It is my personal development slash etiquette coach. Mr. Philip Sykes of the British School of Excellence. He is the CEO and principal of the organization. Welcome, Mr. Sykes. What a treat to be with you on this daily, the Grace and Grind podcast. What a joy. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. I'm so glad that you could be here today. Even though we kind of put this together quickly, I'm so glad that you said yes. You know, there's one thing in life. You've got choices. You say yes. Or you could say no. Now I could have said I could have said no, but then you would have found someone else. And it would have been you. And this is special to me. So I'm so glad that you did say yes. It's important to say yes in life and then get on with it. Absolutely. So can you share a little bit about your journey to becoming an etiquette coach and your experience with working with professional women? Firstly, I have to put it down to my parents, but I think not to see my father. My mum was very much the one that looked after and, and spearheaded the family when it came to, you know, the discipline, understanding the importance of how etiquette and manners are such a quintessential tool and, and really your foundation in life. And I'll never forget from a young age, and even now I'm in my mid-50s, my mum will still angle to correct where, where she feels necessary. And I, I don't look at that as a a scolding or embarrassment. Yeah, my mum was very clear on on manners and etiquette and kindness and helping other people. And I touch wood, I can honestly say that it runs through in our whole family. And we were also very, very fortunate, uh, Dr. Pamela and listeners, is that we did go to a very good school and the school very much had the motto, manners maketh the man or woman. And that for me is fundamental. Jumping into the next part of your question, for me, I've always felt, and, and funny enough, from a young age, I've always had a really dynamic bond with the opposite sex. I always had girlfriends older than me. I always seemed to connect on a very deep and meaningful sort of level with, with older girls at the time. Uh, there was no physical relationship. It was just friendships, and I bonded very well with older women. And throughout my life, I've always been very fortunate to meet incredible women and surround myself with very, very dynamic women. And here in our organization, funny enough, I'm surrounded by a powerhouse woman who really give me a kick up the rear end when I need one, give me guidance, the steering, great sounding boards. And I only can say one thing is that women tend to be more in general, more empathetic, more sympathetic, more sort of understanding. And they take on board their, that motherly instinct, even if they aren't, a mother, there's a, there's a nurturing in a lot of women. And that for me is fundamental in this world. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. And I would agree with you with that sympathetic and warm um, attribute that women have. Not just saying that because I am a woman, but I just feel like that is the way that God created us to create that balance in the relationships. So I would agree with you wholeheartedly. So, um, Mr. Phillip, you are on both sides of the coin. You train clients, but you also train interested etiquette consultants. What would you say is the greatest development need for today's professional women, just based on your personal experience? For me, it is the ability to believe in yourself, firstly. Okay. Really take time to believe in yourself. And if you need guidance and steering in that level, then take on coaching and guidance and steering from someone who can give you that confidence, help you build your confidence. Secondly, the ability to really take on board the power and importance of listening and engaging with people, understanding how important your, your human touch is, how important your ability to build and grow people, those leadership skills, the art of communication, definitely building your emotional intelligence. Those will all be areas that will serve you hugely 
in taking on your responsibility as a leader. And a leader doesn't necessarily mean the CEO or anything of an organization. Within you, you are a leader. If you have the ability to spearhead a team of personal assistants, a team of sports development coaches, you are a leader, you're guiding and steering. So don't ever think of this as, and to be a leader, you need to be at the top of your organization. That's true. In my uh, last podcast episode, I talked about leading from what, where, whatever context you're in, whatever level you're in, just lead to the best of your ability from that space and see how we can make this dynamic change in the world. So speaking of leadership, the British School of Excellence has more accreditations than any other organization in the industry, which has positioned you as the industry leader. Why was accreditation so important to you? For me, anyone can go out there and set up coaching and guidance and steering, which I applaud. I think it's just phenomenal. We were sort of going into a market that a lot of people looked at oh, etiquette and manners. What's that all about? Is it for the wealthy people? Is it for, what is it all about really? There was a lot of gray area within the importance of etiquette and manners. And I just realized out there, there are many coaching organizations who hold accreditations, but people in this arena of etiquette and manners and I bring in heavily emotional intelligence, ladies and gentlemen that are listening to this is Something that I've always, it's always sat with me. Many years ago, I had the ability to set up a coaching and training program for adult learners who wanted to transition into, believe it or not, the construction industry. And I wasn't obviously training in that area. But the one thing that I realized right from the word go, we have to attach accreditations to this to make it solid. What we share with our audience, what we share with our students is well-researched. There's statistics, there's it's accountable research. It's not just, oh, I heard someone say X, Y, and Z. And when you go for accreditations, for those of you out there who are not familiar with the process, it's not just you sign up for an accreditation and they hand over a piece of paper. You spend about six months, maybe even a year, to getting all your ducks in a row, to getting your paperwork in a row, to getting your lesson plans in a row, to giving this uh, sort of a solid foundation in order to then become accredited with what is known as an, an accredited awarding body. So, for example, City and Guilds and ILM here in the United Kingdom are very much, it's an institution that has been around for well over 100 odd years. And there is a standard they set. And so we wanted to get up to that mark of a standard that gets set. And then getting CPD accreditation, there's a standard that this, this Continued Professional Development Consortium sets. So this for me was fundamental. And one wasn't good enough because there are easier routes and, and lower barriers to entry. For us, I wanted to go for the highest accreditations we could possibly uh, take on board. And funny enough, while we're talking about that, Dr. Pamela, I'm really interested uh, to share with you or share with you that we're now looking at how we can get various accreditations over in the USA that would be recognized under the USA umbrella as well. I just want to share uh, one thing. A few months ago, Dr. Pamela, you decided to come on the train, the trainer and jumped in with both feet the second time around, and this time you came to London. And that was in June this year, and you joined the Train the Trainer in person as our wonderful, amazing guest, and you also came along, and you didn't shy away from the opportunity to give the Train the Trainer students an insight into you, your background, but not only that, your ability to guide and steer people with incredible life-changing skills and how you go about working with the youth and adults in your community and about, and, and beyond that. And your presentation was not only well laid out, but it was so dynamic. It was something that everyone is riveted to. And here is someone who doesn't just walk the walk, she talks the talk as well. And not only that, you're incredibly well researched. That's your, I know your background and passion. And so you know, with that uh, in mind, not only were you phenomenal, but along with my business team and colleagues, we have very much identified that we very much are bringing you into the fold here at the British School of Excellence. And we are hugely 
excited to bring you into the family here at the British School of Excellence to take on the responsibility of flying the flag for the British School of Excellence out of New York, Rochester, uh, with a huge picture and a huge vision in mind. And we're going to be incorporating some incredible material uh, for the teenagers to start off with. We're going to be delivering a huge program where we're going to be able to train other trainers who want to step into the likes of your shoes and the shoes of other coaches within the British School of Excellence. And that you're going to be a representative. It's going to be very much a flagship opportunity. You're going to be the first one flying the flag in the USA per se uh, under the banner of the British School of Excellence. And it's an absolute honor to have you on board. And, and we are yeah, just overexcited actually to, to see how the, the future sort of unfolds. Thank you, Mr. Philip. I can't tell you how honored I am to have been asked to carry such a torch. This is truly an esteemed privilege, and I'm just excited to be a part of the team and to be working so closely with you, and I'm looking forward to just absorbing everything that I can learn from you, and I'm looking forward to this wonderful exchange that I know we're going to have. The learning is going to be so uh, vice versa because of your amazing material, background and research. It really is. It's just a win-win for everybody. And when I say that, I'm talking about the wider audience. It's It really is going to open up some incredible opportunities, material, learning op- op- opportunities. So it's a space to keep watching, everybody. Yeah. So look out, Rochester. Here we come. Totally unique Institute of Excellence and the British School of Excellence joining forces. Hooray. <laughs> Wonderful. And I really think that the accreditations for myself and coming to the British School of Excellence for training, it really helped me to decide, you know, where to go because of, like you said, there are many choices where one can go to receive training. But if you want to participate in this industry, to me, it only made sense to come to you because of the accreditations and the laudable reputation that you have in the field. So it just makes sense. And having all of the accreditations undergirds your organization and just makes you a whole lot more credible. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I applaud you for, 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 for really bringing that to, to the forefront because everything in life is, is about your reputation. And look, with all due respect, Dr. P, is that people will always try and take the path of least resistance. Unfortunately, People are wired that way. And going down the route of actually going through and down a journey or down an accreditation route, for example, when you did your PhD, you looked for the best one that would suit you and and give you the kudos and the credibility. It wasn't just one day you woke up and said, oh, I'll just try this, organize that. You've you've done your research. You do these sort of things. And having accreditations gives you cement. It gives you that kudos. It gives you that grounding and that foundation that really takes you to a whole different level. And this is the beautiful thing about the organization is that people who do come through the British School of Excellence, you can shout out and say, hey, I went through this organization. They can look us up. They can see the accreditations. And you're taken far more seriously. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I like the connection that, you know, when your students come, like someone like myself, that we can also say that we have been trained by an organization that is heavily accredited. And then we can also share these credentials on our own website. So that gives us the credibility as well by coming to have training with you. So kudos to you for that. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. So another good question, I think, um, for my women listeners out there, how can women cultivate their leadership qualities without feeling like they have to abandon their feminine attributes? Wonderful question. For me, you don't have to abandon your feminine attributes. Actually dine out on them if I were in your shoes, uh, all the ladies in the world, really dine out on them. I think women have a certain way of of connecting and, and communicating with people. Now, not everyone's the same. I mean, you get the world is full of so many, well, we're all individuals at the end of the day. And for me, I think one of the areas is keeping that femininity, but also understanding the importance of using your emotional intelligence to the highest level, bringing in great communication skills, bringing in your research. I think that's something that stamps authority is when someone knows what they're talking about. With all due respect, nowadays, it's not easy to blag your way through life. There's just so much research out there. All of us can go onto the internet now and find out 
people's credentials, their background. Not only that, you can find out information. Now, I know there's a lot of false information out there. Yes, there is. But hopefully, if you've got your head screwed on right, you will, you will read between the lines that that doesn't sound like it's very true. Now, in this day and age, I'm hoping and praying that people go and do their research before they present or before they decide to go to a particular university or decide which school their children go to. So women never actually dine out on that feminine touch, but be very clear in your message. Be the slowest person in the room as well. And what I mean by that is take on board what is going on around the table, digest it, take it on board. If you need to, Walk out the room for a few seconds, come in, come back in and inter, in, interact and interject and, and share your knowledge and your message because you'll be taken far more seriously on that level. Mm -hmm. So as a uh, leadership and personal development coach, I run across a lot of women, a lot of professional women that have shared that they suffer through imposter syndrome because they're in male-dominated workplaces or industries. How do you think women can find the balance between being assertive while maintaining their grace in these male-dominated industries or workplaces? I think being you is very important, not to try and put your feet in, 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 a, in a male's shoes. That's, that's actually, I think, a very dangerous move you know this is the world is born the world came together with men and women because we need each other for all the right reasons hopefully and uh, we support each other hopefully as we get clear on how the agenda gap is closing and it's closing very very fast and i don't think women need to try and even be a male or be someone who needs to step into the male dominated world just be true to yourself Get the right education behind you. Surround yourself with the most dynamic people out there that will elevate you. Surround yourself with people better than you, that push you, that encourage you, that advocate, that become advocates for you. And if you look around at some of the powerhouse women out there who have got senior roles, look at their, their, their resilience, look at their track record and look at what they've achieved. I know for a fact there was a woman um, within Apple and her name escapes me, but she made more money herself than the CEO of Apple at, at, the, at one stage because she led with such an amazing, clear vision and focus about how she can build her, her audience, as in not her audience uh, as an outside of Apple, but her audience as in the people she managed to give them the understanding of how to go out there and build relationships. And this is where I do believe a lot of women are very good at is building great relationships and nurturing those relationships. And that for me is a quintessential key ingredient and tool to really work on. Yes, I, I would agree with that. Um, just being yourself. Um, but in my uh, business, what I found or what I've researched and found is that um, according to Forbes.com, 75% of professional women suffer with imposter syndrome. What do you think about that? And that's a scary statistic, Dr. P. That really is. I mean, it makes me very concerned, not worried, but concerned. And I think that statistic I'm sure Forbes do their research. They're not a fly-by-night organization. They're taken very seriously. I just, that, that worries me. It does. It's actually not a concern. It's even a worry. And I just feel that those women out there have got to start believing a, a lot more in themselves and, and, and actually stop reading this negative negativity because that's only going to start pushing you and doubting yourself. You know, at the end of the day, it's impossible to have a positive and a negative thought at the same time. So the moment you start to feel that imposter syndrome, don't voice it because our words become very much part of our, our, how we see ourselves going forward and in the future. You know, start to voice positivity over your role, over your position, and look down um, at creating vision boards of where you see yourself going in this world because there's no need to feel that imposter syndrome. I know easier said than done. But again, I'm going to go back to surrounding yourself with people who push you, who encourage you, who give you that, that confidence. And, and again, find an amazing coach to coach you through this, this sort of mindset that you might find yourself in, because it is all in here. Mm -hmm. But what if I am one of these women that is suffering with imposter syndrome and I find it difficult to even walk into a professional setting? What advice would you give to uh, a professional woman to go in and make a memorable first impression, even though she's feeling a little apprehensive about her skills and her abilities? How could she make a, 
a memorable first impression? Firstly, dress accordingly. It was really interesting uh, as you, as an alumni, uh, one of the past students that was on the um, on our Dr. Jackson show earlier on the power of etiquette and manners, uh, BC from Nigeria, she said, dress the way you would like to be addressed. Dress the way you would like to be addressed. And that's the first time I've heard that expression. I thought, wow, that is so phenomenal. I mean, I know, Dr. Pamela, you make a grand entrance into any room. You've obviously got your height. You walk in with confidence. You walk in with a great smile. You walk in looking great. You walk in smelling great. And that in itself will, will make a grand entrance. Uh, that in itself is going to give you the ability to at least feel confident. You might have those butterflies going on in your stomach, but the way you walk into a room, the way you present yourself, your body language is going to give you that uplift. And I know for a fact there's an amazing book written by, she'll come to me, she's a doctor here, Dr. Uh, Dr. Pine. She wrote a book about uh, in clothes cognition. And in that book, there's a, a mention to when you put your power suit on, it gives you those wings. It elevates you by a huge amount. It, it goes into the 10, 15, 20% element of how it elevates you. Before you even are heard, people see you. So that for me is definitely a, a, a very powerful way of, of, of gaining people's uh, interest and also taking you more seriously. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I would have to give my grandmother credit for that because she would always say, you should look good you should smell good, and you should be good. That has been one of my mantras ever since I started learning how to dress and put myself together. I want to make sure I look good, I smell good, and that my conduct is good. Wonderful. Yeah, it, and it absolutely is true. I was just teaching a class at one of our local universities um, earlier in the week, and when I walk into a room, I make it a habit to not say a word. I walk from the back of the classroom, from wherever the door is, up to the front of the room. I may give students some eye contact. I may wink. I may smile. But I never say a word because I know I'm going to get, get to the part of the curriculum when I ask them about my first impression. And what did I say? Did I have to say anything or, or did I just was I just in the room and you noticed me because of the way I carried myself? And the students all with a, with a resounding, you didn't say a word, but you were professional, you were stellar, you smelled good, you looked good, you were confident, you came in like a boss. And my message to them is that you want to be able to walk into a room, captivate an audience without saying one word. And the people will flock to you just because of the way that you carry yourself. And I, I firmly believe that because it's been true for me for many, many years. So, yes, you you are on to something with that, Mr. Philip. I, I wholeheartedly agree with you on that. Make yourself memorable. I love how you just shared that, you know, what your grandmother shared with you. You know, let's listen to the, the people that became came way before us. They've been there. They've done that. They've got the T-shirt. And it is something so key. And, and I don't, Dr. P, I hate that word fake it until you make it. It really makes me my skin cool. But one thing I would like to share with everyone out there is act until you become. Act until you become. That for me is really important. And, you know, what I'd like to also share on this note is look at people who do make that beautiful entrance. Look at those people who do stand out for all the right reasons and always make yourself memorable for the right reasons. So, Dr. P, if I met you at a networking event and hypothetically, let's say I wasn't particularly good with names and I'm meeting someone that I've just spoken to you and I meet someone across the room and I say, you've got to meet that amazing woman. She was wearing this unbelievable mauve uh, sort of corsage and she had her hair tied back. She walked in tall. She's dynamic. You've got to go and introduce yourself. That is what's key here. And that's what really makes a massive impression. I like that. So what was that? What was that um, phrase that you used? Not fake it till you make it, but. But act until you become. Act until you become. Oh, I'm going to adopt that. Yeah, it's so important. Act until you become. There's an amazing TED talk about the importance of our body language. It's by Amy Cuddy. She gets a great message across to all those wonderful listeners out there. Watch the Amy Cuddy TED Talk. Um, I'm going to urge you to get off your wretched social media and start to educate yourselves through 
through great TED Talks and through listening to podcasts such as this, educate yourself, give yourself the opportunity to really develop and grow your mind. And Amy Cuddy talks about the fact that she felt she had imposter syndrome. And it's a really wonderful message. It's got a lot more messages in her TED Talk than just that. But I want everyone to understand at any point in time, we have maybe felt like an imposter, male, female, whatever age you might have been. So there are ways of circumventing this, that is for sure. Wonderful. What are some daily practices or habits that women can adopt where they could actually act until they become? You have to 150% be consistent. In other words, create good habits for yourself. That is something I urge every single one of you. Have a, create a routine. It's like a daily plan. Get up in the morning and I'm going to encourage exercise. Exercise is not just for your body, but it's for your brain. You know, if it's not going for a run or a jog, do some Pilates, do some stretching, do something, run on the spot for 10 minutes, get your adrenaline pumping, get into a rhythm and routine of how you do your makeup. If you need, just go and get some professional help with a, a stylist or a, or a person who can give you some guidance in how to best present yourself. Because ladies out there, and gents as well, if there are any gents who are brave enough and, and, and sensible enough to take on this podcast, they are going to be colors that suit your complexion. They're going to be styles of clothing that suit your complexion. So that in its first place is going to elevate you because you know confidently that you're feeling good in what you're wearing. And that's you halfway there. And then create these really, really good habits and be consistent in those habits and and, and really a good habits, all these sort of habits, it's, it's going to take time. Don't think it's an overnight um, sort of success. Overnight success normally takes many, many years, but um, that's obviously business related. But this type of success, you can start to master within three to four to five to six weeks, 100%, if not sooner. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that. So we've talked about gender differences and male domination in the workplace or in certain industries. Let's talk about culture a little bit. Um, how important is it to be aware of different cultures in the workplace? Sure. More than almost anything, being aware of cultural differences is gold. You have to, have to, have to go out there and understand that we live in, and people are going to get it fed up of me saying this, but we live in a small world, but I wouldn't want to paint it. And the thing is, the world, everywhere we go now, they are multicultural, mixed cultures. And you would be doing yourself discredit and you'd be discrediting the people you come into contact with if you do not make an effort to go out there and understand the cultural differences that we have. In this country, we might have first generation people from Africa and they, they're born here, they've gone to school here, but they, they are cultural differences with their, 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 their family and their upbringing and they have to wear different cultural hats. Uh, we, who are born up, I was born up, brought up in, in, in South Africa, but I've been in this country 25 years in the UK. There are cultural differences, even though I might have a white skin, there are very strong cultural differences in Africa. It's multi, that is a multicultural country. And in, a, in many ways, I'm grateful that I grew up there because I learned from very early on that you've got to be respectful of the different people you come into contact with. And it's such, an, it's such a privilege, in my opinion, is to learn the importance of how we can connect on, on this diverse culture. It's a way of growing. It's a way of learning. And it's a way of building such great rapport with people. And it gives me goosebumps in sharing that. And it gives you this ability to travel the world with such an amazing open mind and confidence. And I can't stress enough to make an effort to understand cultural differences. And at the same time, don't just assume that that person that you're meeting, whether it be at a cocktail party or at work, has had a similar upbringing or background to you. Even though you might uh, come from different parts of the world, you can't just assume that your experience that's coming up this weekend they will be able to relate to. So this is, again, there's a lot more to the cultural uh, diversity out there and cultural intelligence that we need to adopt and adapt to. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Philip, you've, you've traveled the world. I mean, you, you've trained people in different countries. You've traveled extensively. How has having this cultural aptitude helped you out professionally or even personally? 
It's given me the ability to feel confident in any given situation. That is for sure. And if I don't know, I zip it up. I ask questions. I embrace going to new countries and meeting people from all over the world, all walks of life. And I don't care their background. I don't care whether they come from the upper echelon of society or they come from the, the lower class, the lowest of lower class. It, 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 give me anybody and I just want to get to know them, understand what makes them tick. Uh, I've been privileged to be in some of the poorest places in the world. And I say privilege because that is the biggest wake up call uh, for, for not just for me, but for all of us to understand is, you know, the likes of you and I, uh, and, and hopefully the listeners, we are the top 3% of the most fortunate people in the world. We need to understand this on a daily basis. And I, I want to get down into the nitty gritty of, of mixing with people that are still smiling, yet have very little. And what keeps them going and, and, and understand their mindset and their culture from young children of two, three years old to 70, 80 odd year old people. And it's just a privilege to be able to sit around uh, their so-called campfire and, and get to understand what makes them tick, their background, their story, and be very open minded and understanding having a what can I learn from this conversation? What can I take away from this and what can I give in return? Great answer. I love that. And speaking of culture, you know, there was once a time when it was believed that only highborns or royalty or the wealthy were individuals that could or that would operate with right conduct or good conduct or had etiquette or could display proper mannerisms. Um, what would you like to debunk regarding that? That whole thing should be thrown out the window. Um, quite frankly, uh, you know, with all due respect, uh, manners and etiquette does not take uh, academic qualifications. It doesn't take anything like that into account. I've seen people throughout the world who have got very little, who haven't got the education, who come from, as I mentioned earlier, the lowest of the lowest classes, yet they are the most beautifully ornate, sincere, kind, caring people. And let, I'd love to paint a picture here. A couple of years ago, there were uh, a couple of youngsters who dressed up as hobos and they went into an upmarket pizzeria restaurant and they went and asked someone, look, I'm really hungry, may I have a bit of your pizza? And all the so-called people who could have were like shying away. And then what they did is they went and bought a couple of pizzas and they handed them out to a couple of homeless people around the streets. And then a chap again dressed up as a homeless person went and sat next to another chap and said, I haven't eaten today might there be a little slice of pizza? And he handed him the whole box. And that for me hits me straight in the heart because Dr. P, I just don't understand people who have all this money and all this bravado. And in, in other words, this, there's, there's too much arrogance in this world. We need substance. We need less arrogance and more substance in this world. Arrogance doesn't have a place in this world on any level. And it was actually quite funny, uh, interesting. I read an article just yesterday about Will Smith, and they talked to him. They said, "What make? what's make you happy? And he's got all the money in the world. He said, I started out trying to raise money. I then made lots of money. I'm giving all that money out. He said, all that matters in this world is being kind, caring, and showing love and respect for people because that is the, that is the real core ingredient. I'm not for one second saying we shouldn't work hard and go and earn money. Money is a tool. It's there to serve us. It's there to serve other people. And yes, having money does help. But I've seen some of the most miserable people out there in this world. They've got more money than God's got children. And they are miserable to an inch of their lives. So please, ladies and gentlemen that are listening to this incredible platform, Grace and Grind podcast with Dr. P, just understand that go out there and put yourself out into the universe. Be kind, be caring, be thoughtful. And if it doesn't come back to serve you, it'll come back to serve someone in your family, somewhere along the journey, along the road. Absolutely. I agree one, wholeheartedly, 100% with that, uh, Mr. Philip. So let's talk about pet peeves. So my pet peeve with, <laughs> with etiquette is sitting at the table, dining with someone, and they don't have proper, they just do not have proper um, dining etiquette or <laughs> they... Like, for example, I was having lunch a couple of days ago and we were having soup 
and someone dunked their bread in their soup and another person picked their bowl up and started <laughs> drinking from the bowl. When it comes to etiquette, dining etiquette is one of the sticklers for me. Do you have a pet peeve? Oh, Dr. P, don't get me started. I've got a few. <laughs> I think one of my, my, my biggest pet peeves is rude people. Uh, it really, rude people, I don't believe there's room or space in this world for rudeness. And in other words, unkind people. I think in a world where you can be anything, just be kind. And with all due respect, you know, just yesterday I was actually working in, in London and I come back on the train from where I work in London to my home. And the, the train was pretty full and there'd been delays and cancellations. And I got to this one door, opened it, and a, a chap stood in the doorway. And he looked me up and down like, what the heck are you doing here? There's no space. I said, would you excuse me? He said, no space. And I said, excuse me, I can see some space there. I'd like to just get in. And he moved aside. And I just, it, it actually riled me. And eventually there were people looking at this chap as if he was a complete idiot. And I turned around to him and said, you know what, young man, in a world where you can be anything, be kind. That's all you need to do. And I made quite a thing about it. And then I just zipped it up and he acknowledged it. Now, I'm not there to go and, and shame, name and shame people. But if someone's going to be unkind to someone or bully someone, I would definitely give them a piece of my mind. And I would do it and I would kill them with such powerhouse words that would actually make them want to feel that they just had a hole they could crawl into. So kindness is, uh, is, is crucial. The, the other thing for me, believe it or not, is litter. Litter is just something that gets my goat. And we live in a beautiful countryside here in the UK, the UK. And the amount of litter I see on a daily basis is, for me, I think it's, that's criminal. Mm -hmm. So we're wrapping up here. And our last question uh, would be, if you could give three simple etiquette practices that my listeners can start implementing today to improve their interactions with others or just to make their lives easier or better, what would those three simple practices be? For me, Dr. P, it starts with an incredible smile. When we're walking past people, smile. Give them eye contact. Just saying, hello, how are you today? Or just a beautiful greeting. That for me is, people have forgotten this human interaction. And we need this H2H. We need this human-to-human -human interaction. So smiling saying hello, a beautiful smile, and take it one step further. Pay people a genuine compliment where a compliment is due. That's a good place to start. And then from there, you drop the pebble in the, in the pond and the ripples then start to take place. I love that. Well, Graceful Grinders, join me in saying thank you to Mr. Philip Sykes of the British School of Excellence in London, England. Mr. Phillip, thank you again so much for being here. I truly appreciate spending this one-on-one -on -one time with you. That's all we have for today, folks. Catch us on every other Thursday where you can listen in to the Grace, Grace and Grind podcast wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. Tune in on next Thursday. Thank you so much. And always remember to create a totally unique day on purpose.